linoleic acid itself is probably totally harmless. It's the stuff it turns into in your body, right? Seasonal allergies, gone. Check out this review on histamine and immune from Heart and Soil Supplements. I started using histamine and immune at the beginning of the Texas ragweed season to see if it would help my horrible allergies. I'm very pleased to announce that I am completely off all antihistamines and steroids for seasonal allergies. I have never gone an entire September and October without being miserable. There have been a lot of early season bow hunts ruined because of my allergies, but not this year. So amazing. Thank you, Heart and Soil. I love it, guys. Histamine and immune has thymus, it has lung, it has kidney, it has spleen, it has liver, and it really helps people with eczema, with rashes, and with seasonal allergies. Check it out at heartandsoil.co where you can find all of our supplements. They're the finest desiccated organ supplements on the planet. They are all grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised. They are all packaged only in glass. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal health at heart and soil. On this week's podcast, I had my friends Tucker Goodrich and Jeff Nobbs. Jeff and Tucker have been collaborating on some amazing blog posts at Zero Acre. That's Jeff's project that you will hear about in this podcast. But we went deep down the rabbit hole of seed oils. We talked about studies that people would levy or would advance to say that seed oils are fine. We talked about the conflicting side of the arguments. And we spent a lot of time talking about why seed oils are likely to make you fat, why they are likely making you diabetic, and why they are likely giving you atherosclerosis, heart disease, which leads to heart attacks and all these things. So this is a really cool discussion with Tucker and Jeff about seed oils. You all know, if you followed my work for any amount of time, that I believe these are at the center of chronic illness for all Americans, for people worldwide, because there's an epidemic of seed oil consumption in this country. It's completely evolutionarily inconsistent <clears throat> and the literature is confusing. So hopefully we were able to sort out a lot of that for you guys and make it much more clear. So enjoy this podcast on seed oils with my friends Tucker Goodrich and Jeff Nobbs. And if you want to rep the tribe that says seed oils are bullshit, you can get the shirt just like the Kayla's Bullshit shirt at Kayla's Bullshit. Dot shop. We've also got Kale is Bullshit hats. I'm going to be in Austin, Texas, uh, actually the week this podcast comes out. And I hope to see some of you at Whole Foods in these shirts. I'll give you a high five. I'll give you a fist bump. I'll give you a hug. But you can get the seed oils or bullshit shirts. Let the world know you think seed oils are bullshit and that you are not going to buy into this bullshit narrative that people are telling you about the fact that you should replace saturated fats with seed oils. And you can hopefully help some people around you and um, be a part of a cool community. So find that at kaleisbullshit.shop. On to the podcast. All right, Tucker, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks Great for having us as always. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I'm super excited to have this conversation about seed oils with you guys. Tucker, you've been on the podcast at least once or twice before. Jeff, twice. this is your this is your first time on the podcast, but um, you, you were gracious enough to let me use many of the graphics that came from your excellent blogs in the Carnivore Code cookbook. And um, I threw them up on the screen during the Rogan podcast many eons ago as well. So thanks for all of that. Um, so, so for people that don't know you guys, what are you up to now? And then we'll get into all of this. So Tucker, what are you doing right now? I am spending a huge percentage of my time working with Jeff's team on getting the research message out there about the health problems with seed oils. Awesome. Um, as well as doing some podcasting and, you know, keeping up with spreading the message on Twitter and stuff like that. But one of the reasons when you asked me to do this, one of the reasons I suggested that Jeff should be part of this is that, you know, Jeff, was a huge influence on the final version of the Zero Acres obesity post and is, can I say this, Jeff, unlike a lot of CEOs, he's actually like invested in this product, meaning he's a real believer. He's not just a business guy and, you know, had a lot of impact on this because he knows the science and knows, you know, he, he had a huge impact on the, how this final, uh, post came out and what was included in the messages that were in it. 
Yeah, that that blog post at Zero Acre was one of the reasons I thought we should do another podcast because it's very excellent. We'll link to Zero Acre and the white papers. There's also a white paper on seed oils and cardiovascular disease there. And these are very well referenced, very well written white papers. I really appreciate what you guys are doing there. So Jeff, what is what is Zero Acre and, and what have you created there? And then we'll get into uh, seed oils. Zero Acre is where I'm spending most of my time and is uh, is the one of the solutions, I think, to the problem of seed oils at scale. You know, it, it's why we started Zero Acre. Um, we're making alternatives to seed oils uh, made by fermentation. Our first product is called cultured oil. And, uh, you know, I, I've been banging my head against the wall for the better part of the last decade on how we get seed oils out of the food system. My background is in uh, is in food, I have some restaurants and work with other food brands and seed oils are just in everything. This, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, you guys know this. And so um, and so with Zero Acre, you know, we're trying to not only make products that can replace seed oils, but also educate on the issues with seed oils. And, um, and you know, that's what we did with the white papers that we talked about and hopefully what we can do today. Awesome. Yeah. When I was recently in Phoenix, Arizona, I did this bit of content where I went to a number of semi-fast food restaurants. I went to Chipotle. I went to a Mongolian grill. I went to a restaurant and I asked them what cooking oils they use under the guise of saying, oh, I have an allergy to these oils because I think after this podcast, people could could say that most humans probably have a quote unquote allergy uh, to seed oils in some way, shape or form. Um, but uh, I, I asked them, what oils do you use? And, and they all use seed oils invariably. The only place that did not use seed oils was Smashburger. And we found out later they actually do use canola oil, but didn't tell me they use canola oil. So the Mongolian grill said they cover the grill in canola oil. They soak it in canola oil at night. They said, you can't ever eat here if you have an allergy because literally our food is just totally drenched in canola oil. All the other like Yogi grills and stuff would either use soybean oil or canola oil. They use it in the fryers. They use it on their grill tops. The restaurants would say they use olive oil and canola oil. When you actually look at the olive oil, it's usually pomace oil, which is not good quality or extra virgin olive oil. It's not like a cold pressed olive oil. Went to a Greek place. It's the cheapest, worst olive oil, quote unquote, you can get. Um, But they say olive oil. I went to Chipotle and they said it's rice bran oil, which is actually pretty high in linoleic acid. And then they kicked us out. You can't film here. You can't film here. And uh, so anyway, just this is just to say that that the mission that you guys are a part of is is really, really important. And, and I appreciate what you're doing and what Zero Acre is doing with the education and the cultured oil in general, um, because these seed oils are ubiquitous. So, um, Jeff, why don't you just well, start just, us off? Just, yeah. just one point there. It, yeah. Education is awesome. But and lots of people have responded to this and said, well, I'll just stop eating it. And yes, that's great. That's a great alternative for an individual is just to change their diet. But when 20% of our food supply in the United States is seed oils at this point, you can't just cut that out of the food supply, right? You need an alternative. Yes, that's a very good point that you can't just cut it out of the food supply. And I know our mutual friend, Anthony Gustin has thought about this as well. Unfortunately, um, there's probably not enough cows to make butter and tallow to replace all of the seed oil in the world. So we need something um, to do that. And and that may be a really, really valuable thing that that Zero Acre, I think that's definitely a valuable thing that Zero Acre is doing. Um, So Jeff, what what are seed oils? And at a high level, and then we'll get into the, the weeds here in a moment, why do we think that they're potentially bad for us? Oh man. All right. So, um, we don't want this podcast to be six hours, right? No, we don't. (laughs) I'll I'll give the abridged version. Um, and, and so what are seed oils? Um, seed oils compared to vegetable oils, those terms are kind of used interchangeably, but technically, uh, vegetable oils are the broader category of any oil that comes from a plant or crop, whether that's olive, palm, avocado, coconut, or corn, canola, soybean, sunflower seed oils are a subcategory of vegetable oils that include oils that come specifically from seeds or grains, which are uh, technically the seeds of grasses. Um, So sunflower seed oil, rapeseed oil, also known as canola oil, um, soybean oil, rice bran oil, which is a a grain or seed. Um, That's what seed oils are. And, um, you know, we we talk about linoleic acid and omega-6 fats a lot. And the reason that those terms are somewhat synonymous with seed oils 
is because seed oils have by far the highest content of these fats. And uh, th these fats are found in all foods in very low amounts, but in seed oils, they're found in abundance, uh, you know, orders of magnitude more than in any other food. And so uh, throughout this conversation, I'm sure we'll be talking about linoleic acid and, and omega-6, as well as seed oils. Um, and I think we can kind of use that interchangeably for, for that reason. And a high level, why do we think they're bad for us? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think it starts with um, evolutionary precedence. And nutrition is probably the worst form of science and that most of our nutrition science today is you know, driven more by politics than actual science. And, and there's actually very little that's scientific about how, how we currently make nutrition decisions. So it's helpful to have other frameworks that we can look at to, to figure out what should we be eating and evolutionary biology and, you know, our evolutionary precedent is an important one as is looking at the diets of human populations that aren't sick and aren't obese and looking at what they eat and what they don't eat. Those, those I think are really valuable frameworks, at least as a starting point. So why are they bad for us? You know, first and foremost, there's no history of humans eating them. And usually when we introduce new molecules and compounds into our diets in unprecedented amounts, it doesn't end well for us. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, linoleic acid and seed oils are, are no exception. So purely from a precedent standpoint, um, we haven't eaten them. And any population, any human population that starts eating seed oils inevitably becomes sick and obese. Um, and then similarly, there's, there's no human population that's sick or obese that doesn't consume seed oils in meaningful quantities. So that at the very least should, you know, throw up the red flag that there's there's something worth looking into here. I, I will say, you know, there are some studies sometimes that show some individuals are healthy and they eat seed oils. Um, I, I think, you know, I liken it to smoking cigarettes and cancer. There are plenty of individuals who smoke cigarettes, you know, smoke tobacco and don't get lung cancer, but there's no population that picks up cigarette smoking in large amounts that doesn't also have increased rates of, of lung cancer. So at a population level, you know, something is going on here. Um, and then you kind of take it to the next step of, you know, more, more, um, observational studies, people who, uh, tend to have more dietary linoleic acid, you know, what are their outcomes? They tend to be worse. Uh, take it a step further and look at randomized controlled trials. And there are several randomized controlled trials showing far worse health outcomes, whether it's obesity or heart disease or all, all cause mortality, uh, with increased consumption of, of seed oils. And, you know, we, we can talk about some of those. Um, and then, so kind of broadly, you know, population level data to observational studies to randomized controlled trials. Um, and then from there, there's also just common sense of how much food, real food you would have to eat in order to actually get, you know, the amount of oil that's in like a restaurant meal or a bag of chips. Um, and, and then, you know, Tucker could, um, could wax poetic on all things mechanistic data of what happens when we actually eat seed oils. But I mean, there's fascinating research there showing you know, high linoleic acid seed oils. It's not just the linoleic acid, but what does that linoleic acid turn into either in the frying pan or in your body? <laughs> and what that linoleic acid turns into is potentially far worse than the linoleic acid itself and sort of, you know, ob objectively, uncontroversially toxic, um, you know, more, more so chronically than, than acutely like ingesting arsenic, but still toxic. Um, and then the last point I'll just make, you know, is we're typically using seed oils to cook our food. And many of the studies that are done on seed oils are in a, a fresh state, uncooked. And uh, that's probably not appropriate since, you know, we, we mostly eat cooked seed oils and, and seed oils go from bad to far, far worse the longer that we cook them. Um, and, and there's all sorts of data showing that as well. Um, and the last point I'll, you know, I'll point out just because I think it's uh, underappreciated is how bad seed oils are for the environment. And, you know, there's so much talk of red meat being bad for the environment. Um, vegetable oils, broadly speaking, are, uh, they, they take up more land than, than any other crop. Um, and they're about a third of global crop lands and lead to all sorts of issues with uh, biodiversity loss and deforestation. And, you know, again, uncontroversial, uh, it, it is, uh, the, the data is very clear where we're destroying a big part of our planet to grow these crops that end up uh, ultimately you know, doing us harm and killing us. Tucker, anything to add, to add add to that at a high level? Uh, no, that was a great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so many um, rabbit holes to I go just, down there. Yeah, I just I would like 
say there's, you know, as we start talking about the epidemiology, people often say to me, well, the epidemiology doesn't support this. And I think Jeff, to emphasize the points that he was making, when you start looking at this on a population level, there are no populations that avoid seed oils that have the health problems with the chronic diseases that those populations that have high levels do, right? There, I've looked, I've asked people, I've yet to find a single exception. When you start getting into trying to figure out what a ubiquitous element in the food supply is doing, as most epidemiologists are doing, you know, if you're looking at people in the United States, everybody in the United States has been consuming high amounts of seed oils for over 150 years, right? So, and what the science clearly shows is that the negative effects of these seed oils seem to start at fairly low amounts. So if you're saying, okay, well, everybody in America roughly eats 7% seed oils and some people are doing okay, you know, the number of people in the United States who are metabolically unhealthy, the highest number I've heard is 92%. <laughs> so we're, you know, you're doing epidemiology looking at a almost entirely sick population. And it's super difficult to take that and turn around and say, well, these aren't a problematic because look, 8% of the people are healthy and they're eating seed oils. Super, super important points. And, and I love that in the white paper on seed oils and obesity on the Zero Acre blog, you guys start with the discussion of this, this anthropology and you point out the chimene. So I'll, I'll let whoever would like to talk the story of the chimene or the semene, the Bolivian semene and, and their exposure to seed oils. But I think this anthropology is a good framework for this discussion. And I love what you guys both pointed out that indigenous hunter-gatherer type populations generally don't consume, I shouldn't even say generally, consistently invariably do not consume more than two to 3% of their calories from seed oils. And, and what there we is can... one exception to that and we'll okay. get into them. Okay. And uh, Cause it's, it's the exception that proves the rule in my opinion. Perfect. Yeah. You can tell us about that. And that the, the American population is seven to 10% of our calories from seed oils. Now two to 3% versus seven to 10% may not sound like enough, but it's, uh, or a lot, but it's really important to understand that perhaps the, the actual effect of those oils is seen between that range. And so going from eight to 10% of seed oils or linoleic acid in your diet may not actually have a negative consequence, which is what really understanding the nuance of the research is. So yeah, if you guys want to talk a little bit about these indigenous populations, what they're like in terms of health and what happens when they're exposed to these oils, I think that's a good place to start sort of anthropologically. I'll let Tucker speak to that. Just just want to clarify, Paul, the 7 to 10% number is linoleic acid in our diet. Okay. And it's more than twice that for seed oil consumption. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Big jump. Big jump um, from, uh, from anthropological levels. So the Chimene, and I've heard it pronounced different ways, but we'll go with that, um, <laughs> are a population living in the Amazonian rainforest in Bolivia. They are the favorite population at the moment of cardiologists because the cardiologists went down there and discovered that they have no, essentially no heart disease, um, the lowest of any population ever explored, right? So they're, and of course, they don't have the other things that tend to go along with that. They don't have obesity, low, very low rates of obesity. You know, I mean, We'll get into that. And then they don't have diabetes. They don't have any of these other problems. These are poor people living in the jungle. They live by doing a lot of farming. They have a pretty high carbohydrate diet. Um, some of the interviews I've seen with them, they complain about how they can't get enough meat to eat. And so they're always hungry. Um, but they are, by the standards of Americans, very healthy. And luckily, this is the you know, these folks in the Catavans, who are a South Pacific group, are two of the populations that have been eating what you could call an ancestral diet, right? They're not hunter-gatherers. They're not, you know, a model for the carnivore diet. These folks eat a lot of plant matter. Um, but what they don't, or what they haven't been eating up until recently, are what the research studies call market foods, right? They get their own food out of the Amazonian jungle. Um, then they noticed that things were starting to change. They initially noticed that there was a correlation between motorboat use 
and the beginnings of obesity in this population. And you might think to yourself, well, why on earth would having a motorboat make you fat? And the answer turned out to be because if you have a motorboat, you can get go down the river and get to a store and start buying market foods. So they turned around and they went and looked at a, um, that's my wife trying to keep the dogs quiet behind me. <laughs> <laughs> they looked at what are these folks actually eating? And they found out that the correlation with obesity in this population is their increased intake of industrial vegetable oils that they are getting from stores. And like every other population on earth, the more exposed they get to, you know, industrial diets, they start eating the same foods, which means refined carbohydrates and processed foods and seed oils. So here's, you know, these folks are in the process of leaving their ancestral way of living side and going to a modern diet. And we're already starting to see the negative effects of that diet on this population. And what's likely going to follow are the same things that follow everywhere else, which is, you know, heart disease. And in 20 years, we'll be reading papers about, you know, paradox that Chimene eat a AHA approved prudent diet. <laughs> and they, yet they have high rates of heart disease versus when they were, you know, just living off the jungle and they were all healthy and, um, parody, you know, paradisical. I mean, it's fairly entertaining to see this happen in kind of a sad way. It's kind of like the Israeli paradox that Israelis eat a heck of a lot of seed oils. I think some of the highest amounts in the world and yet have the same or higher rates of heart disease and diabetes, diabetes and obesity as other parts of the world. I don't understand. All of the paradoxes I've ever heard of are not paradoxes. You know, how can the Eskimo eat so much fat and not get heart disease? Well, because they're not eating processed foods. How can the French, right? It, it, like none of these paradoxes, the Eskimo paradox, the French paradox, none of these seem like paradoxes from an ancestral evolutionary perspective. But when viewed through That's the lens exactly. of what is widely considered to be a quote unquote healthy diet, they're all paradoxical, which is just I don't understand why people don't realize like, wait, maybe we just have maybe the lens, maybe the whole overarching paradigm is wrong. Well, generally in real science, you know, to Jeff's point about nutrition science in real science, a paradox means your hypothesis is probably wrong. And you do occasionally get something like the black hole, which was in initially thought to be a paradox in physics. And then they discover they actually exist. But the French paradox or the Israeli paradox are very easily explained that our understanding of the effect of omega-6 polyunsaturated fats on the human body is wrong. And thinking that we're going to eat more of them and get healthier, I mean, we've been going down that road for 150 years. And I keep what I keep asking the advocates of consuming omega-6 polyunsaturated fats is we've gone to the point where we're consuming an enormous number of these, when do we start seeing the health benefits? Well, right? figured, do you yeah. have to get to 20% and then all of a sudden you stop being obese and diabetic and dying of heart disease? You know, exactly. When's the tipping point? That's yeah. We're st still not eating enough. And, and, and you see that in, you know, uh, U S dietary guidelines, we've seen this exponential rise in the consumption of seed oils, you know, a thousand X increase since 1909 in soybean oil alone. And the dietary guidelines say we're still not eating enough. And when you look at basically what a seed oil proponent would say to Tucker, it's that we still got to eat a little bit more to get to, you know, to get to the uh, the holy land of of perfect health. Um, and I mean, it's just a total bonkers response because we used to not eat any of this stuff and be in really great health. If right, we eat more, if we eat more seed oils, our LDL could be even lower. <laughs> And as we'll yeah. talk about later in the podcast, we would still have more oxidized LDL and LP little a, which everyone ignores, but lowering your LDL with seed oils must be a good thing, guys. This, this paradigm must be true. We all know it's true, right? Obviously. Yeah, don't look at the actual uh, health outcomes or, you know, yeah. all cause mortality <laughs> outcomes. Uh, let's just look at the biomarkers. And, and that's right. been, um, you know, I, I wrote a whole post on the issues with observational studies because they're they're the backbone for how we make nutritional decisions in this country and they sound really big and important you know you see a, a 400,000 person study from Harvard researchers that spans 20 years and most people would think how can that be wrong or how could that be more wrong than a 
you know, seven year trial with a few hundred people not understanding the difference between a randomized controlled trial and an observational study. And Paul, you've talked about this in the past, in the past with healthy user bias. As soon as we started recommending seed oils as a heart healthy alternative, anyone who cared about their health, you know, they did yoga and lifted weights and, um, you know, tried to eat more fruit and wh whatever. They also added more seed oils because like, oh, that's the, what healthy people do. And so as soon as that happened, any observational data should have just been completely thrown out the window. There's no amount of controlling you can do to, to account for healthy user bias. Uh, but, but it still drives most of our nutrition policy, sadly. Tucker, what is the exception to the rule regarding the hunter-gatherer or indigenous populations that you were mentioning earlier? It's the Bushmen in Africa. The, well, you know. The Kung? I can't, I, yeah, the Kung. Thank you. I mean, I guess I could try clicks talk, but I'll skip that. So let's just call them the Bushmen because I can pronounce that. Um, they seasonally eat something called a mongongo nut, right? And the mongongo nut, like most seeds, has a high amount of linoleic acid in it. So seasonally, when they're eating these nuts, they get high amounts of linoleic acid. And what does that do to them? Well, it makes them insulin resistant. They can't pass an oral glucose tolerance test when they are on the mongongo nut part of their diet, right? So the only ancestral group we have who does not eat a low seed oil diet is the only ancestral group we know of that can't pass an oral glucose tolerance test. And that includes folks like the Eskimos, you know, the Inuit, who've never seen a carbohydrate bigger than a blueberry. <laughs> And nevertheless, they are perfectly able to pass an oral glucose tolerance test. So we're left with this one little group who eats lots of mongongo nuts seasonally because they have nothing better to eat. You know, they would prefer to eat meat, but they can't. And they fail an oral, oral glucose tolerance test. And when you take them out of that environment, if they go into, you know, a, I guess the equivalent of a reservation there where they're no longer eating these mongongo nuts seasonally, then this diabetic effect of the nuts goes away or what seems to be the nuts in my opinion. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I've been to visit the Hadza in Tanzania and I want to visit the Ikung and I'm, I'm not able to make the, uh, the phonetic click either. It's an upside down exclamation point And then Kung, if people want to search these people are Kung San people, but, um, uh, Richard Lee, I believe has done a lot of research with the Kung San and, uh, in his book, which I've, uh, glanced at, it's quite a tome. He talks about the fact that when they get meat, they eat it with um, quite a significant amount of enjoyment, and they can eat up to two kilograms of meat per day. And it's similar to the Hadza. Basically, the amount of meat eaten in these hunter-gatherer cultures is proportional only to the availability of the meat. But there is a time of year when they eat these mongongo nuts. And I wish, I think if we had a time machine, we could solve so many problems in nutritional science. If we just had a time machine, I'd love to go back 30 to 50,000 years and see how the ancestors of these hunter-gatherers who we believe to be a good proxy for where we've come from as humans were actually living and whether they were eating that many mongongo nuts or whether this mongongo nut um, fetish that they have is a result of infringement on their hunting lands or changes in the actual ecosystems in which they find themselves. It's pretty interesting because certainly with the Hadza, there is a lot of infringement on their hunting grounds and they cannot hunt the animals they want to hunt anymore and they're forced to eat foods that are not necessarily ancestral. They still want to do that, but they can't get as much as they would like. It sounded like kind of like the Chimene, perhaps. Right. And that's, you know, it's an important point to note that, you know, humans have been eating seeds and nuts for probably a very long time. I mean, they found evidence of grain consumption amongst the Neanderthal by looking at dental calculus and, um, you know, the plaque that your dentist takes off your teeth. Um, What's changed in our diet is using industrial processes to extract massive amounts of these fats out of seeds and nuts, right? Which allows you, Jeff put an awesome little graphic together of how many, you know, how, how much corn does it take to produce corn oil? And it's like an enormous amount. I mean, if you eat corn on the cob, it's not oily, right? It's not like an avocado or an olive, you know, it takes industrial processing to get these to get seed oils out of seeds for the most part 60 to 70 or even 90 ears of corn for five tablespoons of oil right jeff yeah i don't know about you i have never been able to put down 60 ears of corn 
uh, <laughs> not on not on my best July the fourth that I eat sixty yeah, years exactly. of corn. <laughs> and I, we did the calculations. I don't know if you shared this one as well, but we tried to recalculate two and a half pounds of sunflower seeds if they're in the hull. So if they're in the hull, it's two and a half pounds. It's one and a quarter pounds if they're already shucked or whatever you do with sunflower seeds, like hulled. And I don't know what it is for soybeans. It's got to be on the order of one to two pounds of soybeans. You may know off the top of your head, Jeff, how That's many pounds multiple of so- multiple cups, multiple, multiple cups, cups of soybeans. Yeah, to get the equivalent of five to seven tablespoons of seed oils, which is what the average American eats in a day, right? Yep. Um, yeah, you'd have to have a really, really long baseball game in order to get through multiple pounds <laughs> of, of sunflower <laughs> seeds. Um, but I, I think that just points to you know, just because it's from a food that is a real whole food does not mean by definition that it's you know good for you or even okay for you. Um, you know, you just wouldn't be able to eat that many sunflower seeds or that many ears of corn. Or even if you somehow did, you probably wouldn't feel like eating it again for many, many months. And yet that's what most Americans and increasingly most of the rest of the world are, are not only eating on a daily basis, but on a per meal uh, basis. And you know, that, that all averages out to e- eating that every single day, day in, day out for most people's lives. Uh, sort of no wonder that leads to chronic disease. It's not like you're going to keel over and die uh, you know, after that one meal or after a week of eating that way. But you do that for, for days, weeks, years, decades, and leads to all sorts of health issues. And it, get, it gets back to the parallel to smoking, right? The pack of, if you smoke a pack of cigarettes once, you're probably going to be nauseous, <laughs> but you're not going to get lung cancer from it. You're not going to get all the other diseases that come from smoking. Um, you know, I mean, even for lung cancer, you need to smoke for 20 years or so. And that's smoking's about as noxious a thing as it's possible for a human to do, dude. <laughs> And Paul, now, by the way, it's about yeah. five cups of cooked soybeans for uh, for five tablespoons of soybean oil. Thank you. That's a lot of soybeans. Yeah. It's a lot of soybeans. Um, there's ribeye in the background getting angry about five cups of soybeans. Um, I think it also speaks to a really interesting idea that perhaps our exposure to linoleic acid may have been seasonal in our history and that increased consumption of nuts and seeds may have happened in the winter or the fall. And perhaps that did lead to some increase in obesity, which was beneficial for those of us living hundreds of thousands of years ago during an actual winter period when food may have been more scarce. So perhaps there is a mechanism here. Now, essentially, we live in an eternal summer now in the fact that we don't have food scarcity. Most of us are quite fortunate to have ed- access to foods all of the time um, during the recent uh, crazy events that shall go unnamed. Sometimes grocery stores were a little bit understocked, but most of us go to the grocery store, which are uh, modern day hunting grounds, and they're stocked the same every day. But at the same time, as we're living in an eternal summer in terms of food availability, it's almost like we're living in an eternal winter in terms of the signals we're giving our bodies by eating this many seed oils every day. So I think that's just an interesting parallel. It makes sense to me, from an evolutionary context, and is a quite a compelling hypothesis. Yeah, and we, and we talk about this in the um, at zeroacre.com slash obesity is, is the, the white paper that we're referencing. We go into detail on this. Um, Tucker, feel free to, to disagree or double down, but I think it's fair to say that we don't know for sure why exactly increased consumption of seed oils you know, lead to increased weight gain and obesity. And, 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 and also we can't say for sure that they do. And, and that's the case of most things in nutrition. Um, you know, studies seem to point to certain outcomes um, or, you know, evolutionarily certain things would happen when we ate different types of food. But there are a number of studies that show increased consumption of linoleic acid and seed oils do lead to weight gain. And so then the question is, why does that happen? And, and that's in animals and in humans. Yep, exactly. And one explanation is what you're describing, Paul, that it could be an evolutionarily conserved mechanism um, from, you know, small rodents to, um, to other primates and, you know, potentially even in humans where uh, winter is coming time to put on weight, to, you know, to, to stay warm and in a time of food scarcity in winter. And so around fall time, you know, there are nuts and seeds that are available for consumption, maybe some grains, and we consume more of those and our bodies get the, get the signal that it's time to put on weight. And there, there are interesting examples in other mammals and in other animals where they're actually unable 
to put on weight and en- enter um, hibernation, hibernation unless yeah. they unless they consume you know more and more linoleic acid. So if you take that to the you know practical extreme, it's that humans are in a constant state of uh, hibernation and weight gain um, because we're constantly preparing for winter. And if other animals are any indication, if you know w- without that increased amount of linoleic acid, we're we're not in a state of hibernation, you know, more energy, more aware, um, less, less weight gain. That's one hypothesis that, you know, we talk about in the white paper. Uh, another is that there's no, there's no intentionality. It's simply, um, something's gone wrong and something breaks and that leads to increased fat storage. And that gets into, you know, what linoleic acid turns into in our body and how that toxin starts breaking things and leading to fat gain. And that's less about an evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily conserved, you know, intentional mechanism and more just about things going wrong. Now, do you, do you want to add anything to that, Tucker? I was going to say, even that effect that Jeff's describing is evolutionarily conserved. They've shown it in bacteria and roundworms and all the way up to humans. So it seems to be, you know, a I mean, what we're talking about here really is fundamental processes that we've kicked to the kicked sideways by overconsumption of these fats, right? Even some of the toxins that we're discussing, HNE, which is probably the best studied oxidative uh, product of linoleic acid, um, has signaling rules in the body, right? It's, you know, a fundamental part of our metabolism, but it's supposed to be there in a certain quantity. And we have, you know, by dumping excess linoleic acid into our bodies, we seem to have increased the amount of this toxin. And everywhere you look through chronic disease, every single chronic disease, this toxin is thought to play a role. And so it shouldn't be surprised, surprising that if you evolve you know, just like in human history, we evolved in a tropical climate and then we decide that we hit, want to move up to the Arctic <laughs> and we had to make a lot of changes. And there were a lot of, you know, genetic adaptations. Um, it's entirely possible. One could argue that we're going through another genetic adaptation to a high seed oil diet. But just like, you know, the first folks who moved to the Arctic Circle probably didn't do all that well until... They figured out about, you know, mukluks and parkas and things like that. You know, in the meanwhile, as you're trying to make this adaptation, you're going to suffer from it. That's how evolution works. And maybe we don't want to go down that road anyway, but um, let's get into HNE in one moment. I just want to share because we were on the topic of the massive amounts of these oils, that you or these foods that you would have to consume to get these oils. And there's this great video that you guys have both probably seen on YouTube that I want to share into the YouTube video. Um, well, we can edit it out of the, of the audio so people don't have to sit through this. But this is how canola oil is made. And I think it speaks to um, a lot of the insanity regarding this oil specifically, canola oil coming from a rapeseed, which is a food that's, which is something that's never been a food for humans. It had to be, I guess, genetically modified to lower the amount of erucic acid. You and I talked about this on the first podcast, Tucker. And yeah. now um, canola actually means Canadian oil, low acid. And that acid that's supposed to be low is the erucic acid, which appears to have uh, pretty negative effects in the heart. And yet this is a massively common oil that comes from the seed that's never even really been a part of the human diet at all. But And this is, so this is what it looks like to those of you watching on YouTube, here's a clip from how it's made canola oil. It has a large revolving screw-shaped shaft enclosed within a slotted cage. As the shaft turns, its threads so squeeze the, canola the flakes oil flakes. with high pressure, forcing out the oil, which then drains out through the slots. 42% of canola seed is oil. This screw press extracts nearly three quarters of that. The remainder is still trapped in the pressed flakes, now referred to as this. canola cake. This chemical extraction process removes all but a trace a hexane of oil. extraction <laughs> with my this organic cell. Canola cake. What's that? I wonder how my favorite part was canola cake. I wonder how long it's going to be until that's being served at various bakeries. <laughs> yes, that'd be, that's totally true. So there's a hexane extraction. The factory then grinds the cake into protein-rich meal, which it sells as animal feed. 
The extracted oil, stored in large tanks, now enters this the refining really phase. Good. <laughs> First, they wash the oil for 20 minutes with sodium hydroxide. During this wash cycle, they spin the oil at high speed so that the centrifugal force separates the natural impurities, which the factory later sells to soap manufacturers. This is exactly how my grandmother After this remember. cleaning process, <laughs> the oil is visibly clearer. However, it still contains natural waxes, which make it look cloudy. So the next step is to cool the oil to 5 degrees Celsius. This thickens those waxes so they can be filtered guys. out. The waxes don't go to waste either. The factory uses them to More produce food. vegetables. So this is what's shortly. in canola oil before it's refined. And just wanted to emphasize to people something that we were touching on earlier, that these oils, whether it's corn, canola, safflower, sunflower... Um, soybean are refined, bleached, and deodorized oils, which means they have to go through this heavy refining process. It may not look exactly like that for all of those oils, but there's a grinding phase, there's a heating phase, there's a bleaching phase, there's a deodorizing phase, there's usually a removal of the wax phase, and it's just this is this is what we're putting in our bodies, guys. This is what this is what people, um, some in the nutrition space, believe should be a part of our diets. I just wanted to show that and kind of loop that I back I don't in. Know, Paul, it makes my mouth water. I wish you hadn't. <laughs> I wish we hadn't scheduled this before lunch. Canola cake for lunch. <laughs> Canola cake, and we can drip some of the wax on top for you, Tucker, because it's it's used to make Ooh, vegetable shortening. Delicious. That the canola exactly. wax like just on top of your canola cake. There you go. That's the diet of champions. So so let's get into H and one one point about yeah. that. After watching that, right. One of the studies that we discuss in our uh, obesity post uh, is one that Kevin Hall did, which has gotten a lot of traction because he compared a ultra processed diet to a non processed diet, right? And one of the variables that he wasn't able to control for was the omega 6 content. And if you look at his results from an omega 6 causing obesity perspective, it's entirely consistent with that. And unfortunately, the definition of processed foods that they're using doesn't say that canola oil is considered to be a highly processed food, which is absurd. You know, I mean, you look at that and you say, you know, that it's equivalent to butter. And my comments about my grandmother, you know, my grandmother could have made butter, right? It was easy. To, it's easy to make butter. All you need is a little wooden drum and you spin, spin some milk around and you've got butter. It's impossible to make these seed oils in any quantity using anything that any one of our ancestors would have recognized, right? I mean, it's just impossible. And that's why we weren't eating them. Yeah, we didn't have machines like that. Sodium hydroxide wash and a hexane extraction of the oil. And yeah, it, it's crazy. It, we would never have gotten this amount of these oils in our diet, uh, even in the food equivalent. And then there are all these mechanistic things that make it probable. So I showed on YouTube uh, a brief uh, bi a brief picture of the actual study from Kevin Hall. I've done some content on Instagram about the study. Super fascinating. The ultra-processed diet group gains uh, two pounds in two weeks, right? And the unprocessed diet group loses two pounds in two weeks. They're served the same amount of food, but they're ad-lib, so they can eat as much as they want in the study. And the diets were matched for presented calories, sugar, fat, carbohydrates, protein, sodium, and fiber. So they were trying to make it as uh, consistent as possible. And what you saw over and over was that the ultra-processed diet, people ate more because they were more hungry, which led to more weight gain, even though they were trying to match for everything, but they could not match for omega-6, presumably, as you're suggesting, Tucker, the omega-6 content of the ultra-processed diet was higher. And this is foreshadowing things I want to talk about with uh, these oils and um, hunger satiety signals. But um, yeah, I'll let you comment on that, Tucker, or if you guys want to dive in, let's actual, let's get into HNE and what it is and where it comes from and, and why it's so important and what kind of research we have on HNE and its issues for humans. I, I would just want to add that um, the, the refining of vegetable oils, seed oils is particularly problematic because of the types of fats they contain. And I, I think the, you know, the, the fact that we, we couldn't eat these oils before modern industrial processing just shows how you know, near impossible it would have been to produce to, to consume high amounts of linoleic acid before modern industrial processing. And you know, th there are plenty of studies showing that things like canola oil, you know, that when they go through this high heat processing before they even go in the bottle, 
Um, a lot of those polyunsaturated fats actually turn into trans fats, which you know ev everyone can at least agree we shouldn't be consuming massive amounts of trans fats. We tried that experiment; it didn't end well. Um, and, and you know, if you refine something like a beef tallow, simply the process of refining doesn't you know uh, it, it, uh, immediately make something like horrible for you. But the the refining and high heat processing of unstable fats makes them far worse. And you have a blog on the Zero Acre website about uh, canola oil, which is excellent. And it points out the fact that according to the FDA or the USDA guidelines, if something contains less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving, you can say it has no trans fat. But there are, I think, at least two studies showing that when they actually look at the amount of these trans fats in oils, including canola oil, we find anywhere from 3.6 to 4.2, correct me if I'm wrong on those numbers, percent of the fats in canola oil are trans fats. And they're supposed to be less than 0.5 or 0.6% of these oils. And so people well, who a, don't, yeah. In a food, you're allowed to, you know, in a food, you're typically allowed to say if it's less than half a percent that there are no trans fats in the food. And if you're using canola as an ingredient, then yes, they're by law allowed to misrepresent what's in the food. <laughs> Thank you, FDA. <laughs> And in the, in the white paper on the cardiovascular disease and seed oils, you guys point out something that I wasn't aware of, and we can go down this rabbit hole. There's so many interesting parts to explore. We can just bookmark it for a later conversation, that there's research involving these trans fats and arterial damage. I've, I've always wondered, you know, what's so bad about trans fats? But I think the point that I just want to make here without sidetracking the conversation too much is just that these seed oils contain more trans fats than people are being told. And there's good evidence these trans fats are damaging arteries. I don't think anyone in the nutrition community that I've heard is defending trans fats now. We know these are harmful and they're present in more uh, quantity than were being reported in these seed oils. Well, I'll, I'll defend them just because I like to be a contrarian. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make a distinction that the dietary guidelines fails to make. Um, there are natural trans fats, True. Like those found in dairy. The harmful ones are the synthetic trans fats, and the Thank dietary you. guidelines doesn't make that distinction, and they say, oh, well, dairy contains trans fats, so therefore you shouldn't eat dairy, and that is a misrepresentation of the science, right? Natural trans fats have been shown to be very beneficial, um, and they're actually investigating them for anti-cancer and protection against atherosclerosis, so... There's a big there's a big difference there, right? The synthetic trans fats that are produced exclusively from seed oils are the ones from the hydro partial hydrogenation of seed oils are the ones that we need to be avoiding. And yeah, there's you know it's just your body never evolved to process these things. They break your mitochondria because it's a totally novel fat, right? To Jeff's and point before about these new things tend to be problematic. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And at the risk of confusing people, I'll try and preemptively answer a question and, and, and you guys can help me with this one. People will often ask me, what about conjugated linoleic acid, which is a trans fat found in dairy fat? And this is a different molecule. It is, um, it is a different, it has a different, uh, the trans is, you know, obviously linoleic acid is not a trans fatty acid, but conjugated linoleic acid is, is a different looking molecule uh, at the fatty acid level than linoleic acid. It, it's similar in some ways and perhaps in terms of the number of carbons because it's also called linoleic acid, right. but they look totally differently. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, the, the formula is the same. It's just the structure is a bit different. And it is, as you said, part of dairy and that specifically conjugated lin linoleic acid, CLA, is the one that has been investigated for its health benefits, its anti-cancer benefits. And amusingly, at least in breast cancer models in animals, they think that it may be beneficial because it's blocking linoleic acid, right? Your body is taking that up instead of linoleic acid, and it doesn't have the negative effects of linoleic acid, except in large quantities like all the rest of this stuff, right? So the amount you get in beef or dairy, great. Don't go and get yourself, don't try superdosing CLA. That's probably not going to turn out well. Doing things that are evolutionarily inconsistent is probably not a good idea for humans. <laughs> like this Even is, for stuff we like, yes. Yeah, intuitive, intuitive. So uh, just when just when we thought nutrition couldn't get more confusing, 
we, okay, linoleic acid, bad. Trans fats, bad. But the trans fat version of linoleic acid, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. it's evolutionarily consistent and it's something we would have been exposed to in small amounts. And let's also note that the amount of conjugated linoleic acid that people are getting in dairy fat is very small. Uh, very these are small, small amounts. If we're talking absolute amounts, we're not talking anything like the amount of linoleic acid people would be getting in seed oils when we're talking about conjugated linoleic acid from dairy fat and animal fat. So hopefully that right. clear. Lin linoleic acid in those same quantities as CLA would probably be totally harmless, right? Because that's and what we would have evolved to eat. That's probably the amount of linoleic acid that all three of us are getting on a daily basis because there is a small amount of linoleic acid in egg yolks, in the fat on my steak, in the hamburgers that I'm eating, in dairy, but it's, it's a much smaller amount of linoleic acid. I think tallow has what, 2% linoleic acid, 1.9% linoleic acid in the oil, like a tallow or a butter around 2% linoleic acid relative to corn or let's say soybean oil, 40 to 55% linoleic acid in those right. oils. And that's, so that, you know, that's, that's a, a really important point because people hear that things are bad and they're like, oh, well then zero must be best. And that's not necessarily the case. It's not the case in this instance, right? If you're eating evolutionarily appropriate le levels of probably any fat, you're going to do just fine, right? Because that's what yeah. the system was designed to handle. Tucker, do you want to bring us down the HNE rabbit hole for a few minutes? Because I think this is a really important one for people to understand. Right. So HNE is uh, for hydroxynononol. And I will not say that again in this podcast. Um, <laughs> HNE is when you oxidize a linoleic acid molecule, it breaks in half and that's half of it, right? HNE. Now, HNE is a great marker of the negative health effects of linoleic acid because it's only produced from linoleic acid, right? There are other markers that they use that can be produced from omega-6 or omega-3 fats and, you know, different types of, um, you know, different types of markers. This one is specific to linoleic acid. And in the context of obesity, it's very interesting because when they first discovered and started exploring HNE, which was discovered, I'll mention in the context of cancer research, um, they started adding it into, you know, treating basically cell cultures with it. Um, I think it was yeast. And they discovered that the yeast either died or got fat, <laughs> right? So, which sort of establishes one of the important things about HNE is that it's toxic. It's a toxin. I mean, that's not my opinion. That's what, how it's listed everywhere you'll ever read it, right? Um, in large amounts, this is a toxin. It, it also alters how your body, you know, or if you're a yeast cell, your cell processes energy and it predisposes you to storing fat right so a continuous supply of hne which you would only get in a lab or if you're eating the modern american diet is going to predispose your body to constantly storing fat right and they've note they've discovered in these animal models that when you stop the flow of hne this process stops but Unfortunately, in the context of the modern American diet, you can't stop it because you're constantly eating it, as you mentioned earlier, right? Every meal you're exposed to these fats and they're breaking down into these toxins in your body. And it's probably why one of the more interesting epidemiological studies that I've ever found, found that the most fattening food that Americans eat by a huge, you know, by six or seven fold is French fried potatoes. And one of the things that happens to the vegetable oils when you fry anything in it, but particularly potatoes, is that it breaks down into this obesogenic toxin, HNE. The amount of HNE in French fries is pretty enormous, isn't it? I was looking for a study that, that you actually referenced the study in, this, in the blog post, and I was looking for the study because there's actually studies on HNE in French fries. In French fries, in all fry, any fried food that's, you know, where you're frying linoleic acid, it's going to break down into HNE and other toxins. And, you know, some of them are obesogenic. Some of them are thought to be carcinogenic. Some, you know, I mean, HNE, 
when they were trying to figure out exactly why LDL causes atherogenesis, the answer that they came to was HNE, right? Because of the damaging, effect, the toxic effects that it has in the body. Now, okay, I want to come back to linking LDL and HNE. I want to highlight a few things that you said that the source for HNE in the human body is linoleic acid. That's where it comes from. It's not coming from anywhere else. The only other place from omega-6 fats. So it can also be made from arachidonic acid, mm -hmm. which typically you only have a tiny amount of in the body. And perhaps we should have mentioned this earlier. The human body stores polyunsaturated fatty acids in the diet. So like chickens and pork and other monogastric animals or chickens and pigs, other monogastric animals, we don't have a method to get rid of polyunsaturated fatty acids. They end up in our adipose tissue in some proportional amount to our consumption. So um, if we're consuming them vastly in excess, we actually do have mechanisms to get rid of them. And it's thought that that's that the harmful effects is why. I mean, for instance, if you drink alcohol, alcohol is a toxin, your body preferentially starts burning the alcohol to get rid of it, right? You do the same thing with glucose and you do the same thing with polyunsaturated fatty acids. And in fact, one of the things that your body does with polyunsaturated fats is it turns them into neutral, inert um, things like cholesterol or saturated fat. <laughs> so your body knows, you know, I mean, the body's a survival machine. It didn't, you know, we've been around for what, how many billions of years? We got here because our bodies are good at processing this stuff and protecting us from harm. And if you eat uh, polyunsaturated fats, one of the things your body does is convert them into harmless things like cholesterol and saturated fat that don't oxidize and don't become toxic. So the outlet to the bathtub is, is not terribly large. The amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids flowing out being converted is it's kind of a, it's a, in a way it's a bottleneck. I've heard, I've only seen like one kinetic study on how quickly we turn over polyunsaturated fats, let's just say omega-6 fats for this purposes of this discussion. And it was something like 680 days is the half-life, something astronomical. So who knows how long it takes for these things to get out of our bodies at the level of linoleic acid. So we can get rid of them. It's just a very slow process. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's right. And there are certainly things you can do to try and accelerate the process. You know, I mean, you've done lots of posts on the benefits of exercise and fasted, you know, fasting and, you know, but the best thing to do is avoid them in the first place. And, and let's talk about, um, beta oxidation and, and ketogenic or low carb diets, because I learned something reading the white paper that, that one of the ways that HNE is, or I guess perhaps the main pathway by which HNE is disposed of in the body is beta oxidation, which is part of the process of ketosis. Only in a ketogenic state is HNE oxidized. Uh -huh. So yes, and I suspect that that is one of the benefits of a ketogenic diet is that it is allowing you to burn these toxins off as energy rather than having them go out and do damage throughout your body. And That's I mean, very interesting. Yeah, and it, I mean, they've shown this, you know, in animal studies quite clearly where, you know, if you look at... Um, fat consumption in the context of an American diet, right? Using the quantities, the types of fats that we're consuming at the low end, they're not very obesogenic in the middle. They're very obesogenic. But then when you start getting up to the high end, it starts curving back down. And it's part of the reason that it's probably curving back down and getting at a low point at a ketogenic diet is because it's burning off this uh, obesogenic chemical. Ah, uh, that's interesting. So if you, exclusively feed people polyunsaturated fatty acids, they, they go into ketosis and it burns off the HNE? There's one animal little problem with that. And that <laughs> is in excess, these fats are acutely toxic. They did a couple <laughs> of human experiments where they fed people a lot of polyunsaturated fats to try and get them into ketosis and they all got nausea, right? And nausea is a sign that you're eating a toxin essentially. It makes sense. Yeah. And I, I've talked on previous podcasts with Thomas DeLauer about studies with ketosis where they did more or less polyunsaturated fatty acids. I'd refer listeners to that one if you're interested. But um, when you are uh, eating polyunsaturated fatty acids, 
uh, in those studies, it's, it's, it's kind of messing up the metabolism. I'll leave it there without getting too far down the rabbit hole. Um, that's a negative thing for humans. So, well, there's, okay. Yeah, there so, was, you know, just to kind of put the cherry on top of that point, there was a great study that I put on my blog years ago where they looked at, you know, a high polyunsaturated fat diet in rodents and they were lean and they didn't get obese and everything looked great until they looked at their livers and they were all <laughs> suffering from massive liver failure. <laughs> so they were fit and but ripped and that. dying from the inside out. And, <laughs> you know, that's in the context of America suffering from a massive epidemic of liver disease that only started in, in the 1980s. Yeah. And there, maybe this is a good time to talk about, there's one study that comes up when people are trying to defend polyunsaturated fatty acids. And it's this muffin study from Sweden. You guys remember this one? Yes. This overfeeding. I can pull up, I'll show the study. Uh, I'll get your thoughts on it. I, you know, I think that I'll, I'll get your thoughts on it. Then I'll add my, my context to it. But this is, this study um, gets brought up a lot um, when people are trying to defend polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I think it's worth addressing um, why we think this study is potentially problematic from a uh, from whatever perspective you'd like to take it on. Yeah. Um, so there's two problems with the muffin study. The first is... <laughs> We have no idea what these people were eating. This is about, if you would like to scrape the bottom of the barrel of nutrition science, this is the paper that you find. Because the only component of what these people are eating is the muffins, right? That's all that's described. We don't know what, and they're excess muffins, right? So they're eating 100% of their calories as we have no idea what, and then they're getting extra calories as muffins, which are carbohydrates in one of two fats, right? Now, the fat that they're using isn't butter, okay? They're using palm oil. Palm oil is generally thought of being a healthy fat because, you know, by our crowd, because it's pretty low in omega-6 fats. But you start getting into these arcane issues of the structure of the fat, right? You don't eat fats. You eat triglycerides, which is a glycerol molecule with three fats hanging off of it. And it turns out that how those fats are arranged on the glycerol backbone matters, right? And they've done studies with this in human infants because when you get breast milk, you have a lot of saturated fat in the form of palmitic fat, which is named for palm oil, right? And it's in the middle position, okay? And then the other two fats are something else, right? In palm oil, it's reversed. Mm. You, the middle fat is something else and you have palm oil on the, my fingers are not up to this job, <laughs> right? But it's like acid. a fork with I'm three tines, right? Right, right? right. Palm oil, the outer tines are palm oil. In breast milk, the inner tine is uh, palm oil. And that makes a big difference. In human infants, they can't digest palm oil, right? And it's recommended against using palm oil in formula for the reason that it makes kids sick. So to feed a fat that we know to be unhealthy in humans to a bunch of humans where we don't know anything about their diet except that they're eating muffins to excess, right? So we know eating too much is bad for you regardless of what you're eating. We know that eating palm oil can be bad for you, right? Because it's not a fat that we evolved to expect in our diet in large quantities so there's fat this diet doesn't really tell you anything unfortunately right the people who ate the polyunsaturated fat muffins did do a little bit better but we don't know if you put them on an evolutionarily appropriate human diet would this make a difference then right i mean there <clears throat> are populations that they've looked at people overeat seasonally right Humans are supposed to have a lot of fat on us, right? Often more than we would like. And we overeat seasonally to put fat on so that when we get to the dry season or to winter, we have enough fat to make through it, right? So, yeah, this is a not a healthful study. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, just to summarize for people, <clears throat> social glycerides are like fatty acids that have three tails. And what Tucker's describing is that in breast milk, Make sure I get this right, Tucker. The palmitic acid, which is a saturated fatty acid, uh, a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid, if I re remember properly, Correct. is in the SN2 position, meaning it's in the middle position. 
And then in palm oil, perhaps the palmitic acid is in the SN1, SN3, or both positions. So So the position of the palmitic acid matters. And lo and behold, evolutionarily inconsistent consumption of a fatty acid that humans would never have had this much access to is maybe not good for humans. There are huge palm farms about 30 to 40 miles from where I live. And I think, what the heck are they? Why are we making all this palm oil? Um, but it's, 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 again, it's, it's a process. These are refineries to make this palm oil. Humans would never have been exposed to this. And interesting that it's not allowed in, in formula because it, make, it makes infants nauseous or something. It turns into soap in your gut. And the other thing you mentioned about this, this muffin study, just because I want to address um, as many of, of the counter arguments for seed oils or for polyunsaturated fats in this podcast as we can, is that this is an overfeeding study, which is kind of a strange thing. As you said, there are populations that overeat uh, seasonally, but they forced people to gain weight in this study. I think that the goal was, it was a three pounds of weight gain or was it three kilograms of weight gain? They were, they were making people overeat to gain a certain amount of weight. So when they overfeed people muffins, and we don't exactly know how many muffins it took in the the polyunsaturated fat group or the seed oil group. So these are muffins baked with palm oil or muffins baked with seed oils, but they just have to keep eating muffins until they gain weight. And so the people who are um, anti-saturated fat or pro seed oils will look at the study and say, ha ha, look, when the people overate the the seed oil muffins, they did better than when they overate the palm oil muffins. And it's just like, what what is the model that we're using here? And what nutritional universe are we thinking that stuffing people literally beyond their point of satiety until they gain weight is representative of normal life. Well, and this is also their best piece of evidence, which is hilarious because, you know, (laughs) it gets back to our discussion about, they say, oh, well, seed oils are good. They don't make you fat. And we look at the United States where seed oil consumption has gone up steadily. And we are in the middle of a massive epidemic of obesity and other disease and related diseases. And we get back to the, okay, well, how much of this stuff exactly do we have to eat before we start getting healthy again? (laughs) We know that if we don't eat any of it, we're healthy. And, you know, these guys, I guess, are telling us that if we eat massive amounts of it, we get healthy, even though in the animal studies, which they don't like to talk about, we know that it'll give us liver failure. So that's not a good thing. Um, Yeah, I mean. The animal literature is very clear. Um, No one... I don't think could defend any sort of animal literature for seed oils. These oils look extremely bad in animal studies. The, the, the reason why we're, they don't like to use them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The reason we're having this podcast is because we don't have the studies that we would prefer to have in humans that really put the nail in the coffin. So we have to come at it from different well, angles and think about it. But we, but we do. Uh, and we yeah. should, you know, we've talked about, HNE, which is one of the big thrusts of the article, because that's one of the obesogenic mechanisms for seed oils. The other big mechanism where we do have human data is the endocannabinoid system, right? Let's talk about that. Yeah. So endocannabinoids are these chemicals that were originally discovered in marijuana, hence the name cannabis. And endocannabinoid is a cannabis-like molecule that's made in your body. Everybody has heard, at least, of the effect called the munchies, where you um, get stoned and it makes you want to eat. And from what I've been told, you don't crave steak, you crave junk food, right? And now this effect is so well described that THC, right, the cannabinoid, the exocannabinoid in pot, that makes you get the munchies is actually an FDA approved drug called dronabinol, which is used in cancer patients and people with AIDS who have a problem with a lack of an appetite. You give them synthetic THC, dronabinol, and it makes them want to eat. So that's a great thing for them, right? So in your body, you have this process where Arachidonic acid, which where we mentioned before in your gut is turned into endocannabinoids and these endocannabinoids, if you want to make your body to make endocannabinoids and stimulate a hunger signal, the easiest way to do it is to not eat. And your body's reaction of fasting is to make these chemicals that make you hungry and make you want to eat, right? That's perfectly normal. And if you 
eat excess linoleic acid, then your body has more of the building blocks for these endocannabinoids because it converts linoleic acid to arachidonic acid to these um, hyperphagic, meaning they make you eat too much endocannabinoids. So we know that process. It's well described in animal models, and it's so well described in animal models that we had a drug to treat it called Ramonaban. And Ramonaban was introduced in the 2000s. It was considered a miracle drug. You know, interestingly, to get to our other uh, white papers, not only did it re does it eliminate obesity in animals or nearly eliminate obesity in animals, but in humans, it also improves all the cardiovascular and diabetic risk factors, right? So it makes everything look better. It even lowers your HbA1c. So it's it was a miracle drug. Um, and it works because it blocks the endocannabinoid receptors in your brain and in your gut, and it stops you from wanting to overeat from production of these chemicals, right? Unfortunately, in humans, and this is, you know, a good caveat on these animal models, apparently the rodents they were using didn't have the opportunity to kill themselves because that's what <laughs> Ramonaban made people who took the drug want to do. So it was pulled from the market. But it worked. It was effective. And it was considered a miracle drug until they figured out this negative side effect of it. Right. So now we also have the treatment that we're left with. One of the most effective treatments for obesity right now in humans and in animals is um, gastric bypass surgery. Right. The most effective one we have there is Ruin Y gastric bypass, RYGB and RYGB surgery when it's effective and it doesn't work about 20% of the time. And it also makes lots of people who take it want to kill themselves and the suicide rates very high. So it's not a recommended way to cure your obesity, in my opinion. Um, but when it works, it works because you're basically cutting the signal between the brain and the gut that enables this endocannabinoid pathway, right? And all of a sudden you stop craving junk food. THC, if you inject it into the brain of a rodent, makes them want to eat sweet and starchy foods, right? Just like in humans. Um, if you block this pathways, people spontaneously start avoiding junk food and eating healthier foods. And that's why it, you know, one of the reasons why it helps people to lose weight when it works. Um, and I keep saying that because I want to make the point, it only works about 80% of the time, you know, I surgeries not a precise science and they're still trying to figure out exactly what nerves you need to cut to have that effect on the body. And the other problem with this surgery is that sometimes people grow their guts back. The gut is an amazingly <laughs> resilient organ. And it seems that in some cases people start growing new receptors for these fats along the gut and, you know, the effect can wear off after a while and the obesity comes back. But in animal models, this surgery has the same effect as Ramonaban. And what's really fascinating is that if you take animals that have had this surgery and you give them these endocannabinoids, it blocks, partially blocks the effects of the surgery and they start getting fat again. This is super interesting. So I just want to show, I showed this for a moment, but for those who are watching on YouTube, uh, you can see a picture of how they do a Ruin Y gastric bypass. Um, they, they essentially reroute where the stomach uh, connects by <laughs> taking the esophagus, cutting the stomach here, um, and then attaching this sort of blind pouch lower in, in, in the process. So right. do we think, that, Tucker? So that lower part uh, or the upper part of the small intestine that they right. bypass Exactly is where these fat receptors are. That's where the process of making these endocannabinoids happens. So somewhere in the duodenum. Exactly. And, and if people are listening to this, I would encourage you to look up Ruin Y Gastric Bypass. You'll see this image. And, and this what we're doing is we are bypassing part of the small intestine. And how interesting that, that this decreases these endogenous cannabinoids being created. Um, and sometimes I guess then people will grow receptors down in the lower part of the ilium or something, Tucker. Yeah, the gut's pretty amazing. I mean, I had a colon resection years ago and, you know, 
you would think cutting eight inches out of your colon would have a negative impact. But in two and a half days, I was out at a pool party drinking beer and eating hamburgers on the doctor's advice. It's <laughs> unbelievable how capable your gut is of healing, which makes sense because that's the one thing, you know, one of the things in your body where if it don't work, you're not going to last for very long. It has amazing powers of healing. Um, but, you know, when, despite all my caveats about this surgery, when it works, it's miraculous. And the miracle for these people is that they lose this massive craving to overeat, right? And, and it's I, happening because of this well-described mechanism that endocannabinoids control your stimulus to overeat. And now how does that work, right? Because they've done a lot of, you know, and we go through all of this in the post, all the research, they've done some experiments again in animals trying to figure out, you know, what's driving this. What we know isn't driving this is carbohydrates and protein has no effect on this pathway, right? How much fat you eat has an effect on it, depending on the omega-3 and the omega-6 fat components in the diet. Okay. Why are the omega threes important? Because if you eat omega three fats along with your omega six fats, they take precedence in the gut and they replace the omega six fats. So you're not producing as much of these endocannabinoids, right? You're not stuffing your gut full of omega six arachidonic acid, which is turned into these um, endocannabinoids that make you overeat. So that's an important point, right? Because it, which maybe we'll get back to in a little way. But um... Tucker, can I just double down yeah. on, on what you said here? Because I think it's so important and you provide a lot of good detail. I'll try to do like the 30 second version just to, to uh, hammer it home here. THC gives us the munchies, you know, uncontroversial, uh, but smoking marijuana gives us the munchies. And it, there are also cannabinoids within our body, endocannabinoids like AEA and 2AG um, that also stimulate CB1 receptors the way that THC does. And it's the activation of those CB1 receptors that makes us hungry. And uh, increased linoleic acid intake in our diet increases 2AG and AEA, which increases stimulation of CB1. And this has been showed you know, very clearly in rodent studies. And interestingly, um, this will take me over 30 seconds, but Paul, I think you'll find this interesting. <laughs> Another, in a, in a follow-up to that a study in mice showing that increased linoleic acid led to increased endocannabinoids, which led to weight gain and increased hunger. Um, they also did a separate study where they fed salmon increased amounts of high linoleic uh, meal. Why and soybeans? So, and soybeans, yep. And then the salmon had higher amounts of linoleic acid in their flesh. And they then fed, they fed the salmon that ate high linoleic diets to a group of mice. And then they fed different salmon that was lower in linoleic acid to a different group of mice. And the mice that ate the salmon that ate the higher linoleic acid diet actually gained more weight. So if this is an indication for humans, it means, you know, if we're eating chickens and pigs that they had the different, you know, the, the high linoleic acid diet, even if we're doing everything else right, that could still lead to weight gain. Um, but back to, you know, back to the, the THC to, or AEA and 2AG to CB1 activation story, um, you know, carrying that over to humans. Ramana Bant, this study that you know Tucker's really uh, done a good job of shining the spotlight on, that is how it works. It's not like one of 50 ways of how it works, and this is one little byproduct. You know, that that is why it is found to be such a miracle uh, drug. Um, and then when you look at bariatric surgery or gastric bypass, again, it is CB1, the blocking or lowering of CB1 activation in the gut. That is why it works. There are papers on this. We're not making this up. It's, it's very clear. Um, and then just to highlight one other point that, that Tucker touched on. If you directly administer the endocannabinoid AEA, which is one of those endocannabinoids that inc is increased with linoleic acid consumption, that reduces the fat loss of, of gastric bypass, which you know points to it is the same mechanism at play there. Um, all, all of the things that increase, you know, increase your appetite, like THC, and all the things that really help us lose weight, you know, even if there are side effects like bariatric surgery and, and drugs like Ramonabant. They're all working on the same pathway here. And that same pathway is activated when we, when we increase our consumption of linoleic acid. And, and that right there is yeah. why the Tucker plus Jeff obesity post was so much better than my first draft on my blog. 
<laughs> Amazing. And, and why it's great to have both of you guys on the podcast. And so, and the, and so the last piece of that story is, and this is just reiterating what you both said, if you decrease your consumption of sea oils, you decrease the formation of endocannabinoids in the gut, and you are less hungry. And I love that you brought this up, Jeff. This is, people have just, they hate it when I talk about this, but this is one of the reasons that I have concerns about chicken fat and pork fat from animals fed corn and soy diets, because those are going to have evolutionarily inappropriate amounts of linoleic acid in their fat. We know this, I've spoken about it on previous podcasts. You can look at wild chickens wild pigs or wild hogs, and they have four to 5% linoleic acid in their fat. And you look at conventionally raised chickens and pigs, and they have 16 to 25% linoleic acid in their or fat. More. Yeah, perhaps even more. I did a podcast with Brad Marshall about this. Um, it, it all has to do with how appropriate the diet given to these animals is. And though there are people now who are raising low PUFA, polyunsaturated, low linoleic acid pork. They have to be very intentional about what they're feeding the pigs. I've never come across a chicken farm that is able to do that. Maybe you guys are aware. I have some friends that have experimented with chicken feed and gotten the linoleic acid in their eggs down. But uh, it's one of the concerns I have about you know eating tons and tons of eggs and tons and tons of chicken fat in just today when we, we aren't eating wild chickens. Well, yeah. there's to make you feel a little bit better about that there you know as i was describing saturated fat and palm oil there's a similar phenomenon going on in um chickens where a lot of the linoleic acid is apparently attached to phospholipids lipids rather than triglycerides mm -hmm. and there's some evidence suggesting that the damaging form of linoleic acid is when it's coming in a triglyceride not in a phospholipid the body processes it a little differently and the, and the same is true for right. omega-3 fats, right? If you're getting, that's why fish is good, better than fish oil, because in fish, you're getting the omega-3 fats as triglycerides and also as phospholipids. And uh -huh. in fish oil, you're only getting the triglyceride format. Your body needs both. Right, right. And I would imagine there are phospholipid-derived omega-3s in animal fats as well, butter or grass-fed yep. beef yep. being, you know, grass-fed butter having phospholipid forms of omega-3s. That's interesting. So is there a way that you're aware of, Tucker, that they can modify whether the linoleic acid is on a, in a triglyceride versus a phospholipid with what these chickens or pegs are fed? It's, do you think that that makes the bacon and, and chicken fat less problematic than a seed oil? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, as Jeff described, even, you know, the best case for that would be salmon, right? right. And Jeff described that study where even salmon, which have a high level of omega-3 fats, even when they're farm-raised compared to a chicken or a pig, still wound up being obesogenic to the animals that were fed them, right? I, think, I mean, I think, ultimately, the best way to keep linoleic acid as triglycerides out of your body is to eat as little of it as you can. And one of my takeaways is, you know, when we're all of two white papers in. We could probably write 10 more on... Uh, and we, we are planning to write many more on, you know, whether it's insulin risk, uh, um, insulin resistance or the effect of different foods on brain health, Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer, et cetera. Linoleic acid plays a role in all of these. And um, something like the, you know, ph phospholipid form versus triglyceride form may have an impact on one or two of those. You know, maybe it results in, you know, f fewer instances of cancer or it doesn't have as big of an impact on dementia. Um, but it may have just as big of an impact and it seems to on something like obesity and weight gain. Um, so it, it's hard to just pinpoint, you know, does, does that make it all better? And, and Paul, to your point on chickens, um, you know, this could actually be an area where I would uh, I, I align with conventional wisdom of if you're going to eat a chicken breast, you should, or if you're going to eat a chicken, you should eat the chicken breast, not the chicken thigh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Chicken thigh, I think is like unquestionably more delicious, but you know, chicken breast is better because it's low fat. And this is a case where actually being low fat when you're eating something like a chicken or a, you know, or a pig could, could be the way to go. Um, or putting your bacon on paper towels to absorb the excess fat. Right, right. And not uh, cooking with the bacon fat, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, upwards of 30% PUFA. It's, um, it, you know, more, more than canola oil. Um, the, the video of how you make it maybe would be less disturbing uh, or not, depending on kind of where you stand. <laughs> um, but but I, I have a restaurant chain and we actually... For years, um, we're looking for chicken that we could put on the menu that wasn't wasn't fed corn and soy. And I can't tell you how many farms we talked to. You know, even 
farms that have regeneratively raised chicken. And there isn't any unless, you know, maybe there's like one farmer or two farmers who have 12 chickens sort of thing. But to yeah. actually buy at any sort of scale chickens that aren't fed high linoleic grains, I don't think it exists, at least not in the U.S. Oh, yeah, I, not, had a, uh, yeah. I had a farmer I used to buy pastured chickens from and I could go visit them and watch them run around in the field. And they were delicious, but they were like $40 a bird. Right? It, it would not scale up. Yeah, it's it's cost prohibitive um, to get that kind of food. So, yeah. So one of the other white papers at Zero Acres is, is the linoleic acid or seed oils and cardiovascular disease post. This one is excellent as well. I want to talk about this um, briefly and then wrap up the podcast before we get to be too long. We, we all agreed we'd, we'd try and keep it around 90 minutes. We can Let's just hit on some of the high points of the seed oils and, and cardiovascular disease post because this is also really interesting. Um, a lot of people who don't believe what we're saying about the seed oils will say there's no evidence that seed oils are inflammatory. And I look at a number of the references that you guys share in the seed oils and cardiovascular disease post. And I remember our previous conversation, Tucker, and I think, how could you possibly think that seed oils are not inflammatory when they clearly raise oxidized LDL, LP little a, CRP, oxylipins, oxysterols, but I'll let you guys kind of give us a perspective in whatever manner you would like to on, on seed oils and cardiovascular disease. What do we know here? Well, I want to make, there's a basic distinction between these two posts, right? The seed oils cause obesity post, although there's excellent support for it in the scientific literature is kind of revolutionary, right? Even a lot of the experts seem to be I'll say oblivious to the evidence about the endocannabinoid system controlling food intake. The exact opposite is true of the cardiovascular disease post. There is literally no other explanation in the literature for what causes cardiovascular disease than the progression from linoleic acid to oxidized linoleic acid metabolites in the body, initiating and causing the progression of heart disease. I mean, there's a paper that came out recently, um, here, let me just get the title in front of me, low density lipoproteins cause atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And it's a consensus statement from the European Atherosclerosis Society. And it's got some of the most uh, revered scientists in this field. And if you read it closely, when they get to the steps that are required to initiate cardiovascular disease, the very first step is the oxidation of linoleic acid in LDL, which converts it from non-atherogenic LDL to atherogenic oxidized LDL. And they reference a study that was done back in the late 1980s, if I remember correctly, where they actually concluded that line of research by feeding people, first rabbits and then people, either olive oil or seed oils, and then measuring the susceptibility of their LDL to oxidation. And it was clear that in humans, and there have been lots of studies done showing this exact same thing, that the amount of seed oils you consume predisposes your LDL to oxidation, which is the required step to initiate atherosclerosis. So that's a fundamental difference between those two posts, right? <laughs> we are pointing something out that they have been saying privately in the journals for decades, right? There is no other explanation for what causes cardiovascular disease. As this article does, they will say, oh, it's LDL, but it's not LDL. It's only LDL when you have oxidized omega-6 fats in the LDL. That is the required alteration in LDL to make it atherogenic. That's such an important point because I, I go round and round in my mind with physicians um, who will not have discussions with me about LDL and atherosclerosis. Prominent physicians who discuss the lipid hypothesis and the idea that more LDL is always bad or more LDL is worse. And they say ApoB is essentially this, the same measure of, of, of LDL because there are only a few ApoB-containing uh, lipoproteins. 
but they say more LDL is bad all the time. And if your LDL goes up, no matter what else you're doing in your life, you should take a statin. And I think it drives me bonkers. And I don't understand why these physicians won't have some conversations with me. But this is a really, really important point to note that not all LDL is created equally. And to just say that more LDL is bad without any sort of qualification of the oxidation status of that LDL or someone's underlying insulin resistance, which will also impact how oxidized that LDL is, I believe, and the health of the arterial wall um, is, is to me ludicrous and myopic. And so in, in the post that you guys have on Zero Acre, you also note that there have been experiments with macrophages and that yeah. essentially without getting too granular, within the arterial wall, beneath the endothelium, macrophages, these immune cells live. And most people would agree that the beginning of atherosclerosis or plaque formation is a fatty streak. And even before that happens, we get these foam cells. And, and correct me if I'm saying any of this wrong, guys. And these foam cells are, are macrophages taking up LDL. <clears throat> but they're not just taking up any LDL because when we've done the experiments, macrophages will not ingest, quote unquote, native LDL that is not oxidized. That LDL must be oxidized. There must be, there must be um, something that triggers this macrophage receptor um, to take up an oxidized LDL particle. So macrophages will not ingest native LDL. LDL must be oxidized to begin the formation of foam cells. And here we have a hypothesis, or perhaps it's even beyond that, a, a mechanism by which more linoleic acid in the human diet increases the amount of linoleic acid in the LDL particle. And if there's more linoleic acid in the LDL particle, that LDL is more susceptible to oxidation. And we know that oxidation is a prerequisite for the formation of foam cells, which are the beginning of atherosclerosis. Did I get all that right? I mean, what am I, what am I missing exactly, here? How can people not see this? <laughs> that's exactly right. And that was demonstrated by the gentleman who discovered the LDL receptor and got a Nobel Prize for it back in the 1980s, Brown and Goldstein. And the first thing that they tried to do after establishing this pathway existed was take some macrophages and incubate them with LDL and wait for the foam cells to appear, and it failed. So Steinberg and Whitstam, two other doctor scientists, you know, were the guys who finally figured out, oh, it's the seed oils. <laughs> And they have to be oxidized, and then we can make all the foam cells that you want. Um, and you know, that's the paper that that European Atherosclerosis Society references as this is the first step. Right? There's no other explanation. And it seems very clear when you actually look at the data. I think, Paul, to answer your question about how can people not see this, I think the reason is because. This is how things evolve, especially in nutrition science. It's, it's always one broad category, like fat, right? Fat is bad and, I don't know, carbohydrates are good. And then there's an evolution of that understanding. Oh, there are different types of fat, like saturated and monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. And then for a while, polyunsaturated fats were, you know, just good. Before we even understood that there were omega-3 fats and omega-6 fats. And then, you know, now there's m at least more of an understanding of Omega-3 seems to be protective. Omega-6 fats seem to be bad. And it's the same for cholesterol. At first, just it was all about total blood cholesterol. And then there was an understanding of HDL and LDL. And now there's more of an understanding of oxidized LDL. You know, the, the same in all sorts of other you know, aspects of trans fats as well. You know, there are broadly trans fats. Um, there are broadly trans fats. Then there are things like CLA and, and, and trans fats in dairy, as well as trans fats from um, you know, partial hydrogenation very different things. These are just words that humans come up with to categorize these things. There's nothing in nature that says, you know, these two are related in one way and these two aren't related in that same way. They're just the words we use to describe these things, but they're completely different molecules and different molecules have different effects in our body. And so if, if this is like other aspects of nutrition, hopefully our understanding continues to evolve and become more nuanced and granular where we understand that it's the oxidation of LDL primarily through linoleic acid that seems to be the real culprit here. And it does seem like we're going in that direction as opposed to, you know, not that long ago, 50, 60 years ago, where it was just broadly speaking cholesterol. So we continue to get more and more refined. And as we do that, 
you know, the argument for what causes heart disease is becoming very much aligned with the, we shouldn't be eating high linoleic seed oils argument. And we're getting right back to the evolutionary <sighs> argument, right? That these novel <sighs> food products are what are causing the chronic disease, which is exactly what you would expect if you have a system, a well-designed system like a human body and it stops working, you know, speaking as somebody with an engineering background in, you know, if I had a computer system that stopped, started misbehaving one day, the first thing I would look at was what changed on the inputs, right? And that's where, that's where nutrition science is finally getting decades later. Oh, gee, we started eating all this stuff that we never ate before and now we're sick. Oops. And, you know, going back to the categories example I was using, at least we're starting to point the finger at processed foods. That, that, that's a pretty recent, you know, it shouldn't be a phenomenon, but recent phenomenon. In the 1990s, the American Heart Association, you know, there's a whole, I have a blog post that um, actually showing their pamphlet uh, on this subject with Nina Teichel's um, first catalog or took a photo of. And they, they basically have a whole section about how you should eat low fat cookies and hard candy and gumdrops and sugar, as long as you're replacing things like fat with those foods. Fruit uh, Loops were a heart healthy food. Yeah, I, I, they may still even be. Uh, uh, Cheerios are. Yeah, yeah. Cheerios and, are. And Honey Nut Cheerios. Well, they backed away from the sugar a bit, thanks to Gary So Tals. It's only been a decade or two since we've understood, you know, if that, um, that we've understood that processed foods are no good. So what will happen? The next evolutionist will be like, hmm, wait, what is it about processed foods that make them bad? And really, that's going to take us to, you know, refined flours, refined sugars and seed oils. And then we'll probably have another decade of, you know, arguing about which is which. And then maybe in like the 2040s, we'll finally come to the conclusion and we will infiltrate the zeitgeist and everyone will understand seed oils have got to go. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I had um, my friend Tommy Wood on the podcast and we were talking about this and, and he said that exact same thing about processed food. He said, if you just look at processed food, that's pretty clearly a driver of chronic illness in humans. Now, I also want to point out that there are a few people in the nutrition sphere um, on Twitter and otherwise who don't necessarily believe that processed food is bad for humans and think it's just a pure calories thing. Um, and, and that to me is a little bit ridiculous as well. But I, I, I love your perspective, Jeff, and I share it with you that when somebody like Tommy says, okay, processed foods are bad, I'm not um, satisfied by that. I want to know what component of the processing is harmful for humans. Now, exactly. I don't. I don't include processed sugar in my diet. Um, I don't include grains or processed grains in my diet. And I don't include seed oils. So I think that if you do those three things, you've pretty much got all the bases covered. If you look at what processed foods are, they are processed grains, processed sugars, and seed oils. If you eliminate those three things from your diet, you've got the bases covered. Now, the problem becomes seed oils creep into a lot of foods that people think of as healthy, like salad dressings or, or like- chicken or <laughs> like restaurant food. And that's a big deal because that's why it's important to drill down because people may not understand, hey, this salad dressing with canola oil or soybean oil or sunflower seed oil is, is a problem for me and is contributing to many of these issues that I have. And, and people may not even know what their food is cooked in or what the foods they're eating are eating, the chickens, the pigs, the salmon they're eating. So I think it's super important that we move that way. And um yeah, well, that I was, see that that was exactly where I started. I ate a healthy diet. I ate in accordance with the dietary guidelines for the most part. Um and I ate it was literally at the end of the salad bar where I looked at all the squeeze bottles of salad dressings and said that's got to be the cheapest oil known to man to make it into my office cafeteria, right? And I, I was eating a healthy diet and yet I was sick and just making that one change changed everything for me. I mean, you know, 14 years of chronic uh, irritable bowel syndrome ended in two days. And it was from eating healthy things like polyunsaturated rich salad dressings. Is that why you had to have your bowel resection, Tucker? I wanted to ask you about that so everyone understands the full story. I had acute diverticulitis, which is one of the classic quote unquote diseases of civilization. Um, and I can reproduce the symptoms for me personally um, with wheat and vegetable oils. Um, I'm extremely gluten intolerant. I don't know how much that affects other people, but there are clear, you know, I mean, IBS 
alone. This is one of the areas where the epidemiology says there are clear links between linoleic acid consumption and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, you know, and there's a direct relationship between consumption. So I don't know if that'll get you to a colon resection the way it did me, but it will definitely lead you to be ill. Well, having acute diverticulitis with an abscess could get you a colon resection. And yeah. when I was when I was writing um, the carnivore code, I, I thought it was really interesting looking at the literature for diverticulosis, which is the formation of these sort of uh, pouches in the, in the colon that can become infected, and that's called diverticulitis. And a lot of people would think, oh, diverticulosis is you don't have enough fiber, but there's actually no literature to support that that well, that connection. Worse. Yes. Even worse, people who eat more fiber are more likely to have diverticulosis. And there's a large Oops. and yeah, there's a large endoscopy study. I think of over three thousand patients um, that found that people who ate the most fiber had the most incidence of diverticulosis. Now we can't say correlation is causation, but we certainly. Well, but there's there's also different kinds of fiber. I mean, exactly. You know, we we've spent all this time talking about how there are different types of fats. There are different types of fiber. I wouldn't say fiber causes diverticulitis or diverticulosis. I would say that bad, you know, I mean, there are a whole range of issues with wheat as a human food that are kind of outside the scope of this discussion right now. Um, because the original work that they did is in Africa where people who ate lots of fiber didn't have diverticulosis or diverticulitis. So I think it's, you know, fiber in the context of an industrial diet, and I think seed oils are playing a role there, leads to those diseases. I wouldn't doubt that seed oils have some involvement in the formation of diverticulosis. The, the most interesting thing I found was that diverticulosis appeared to have potentially an autoimmune component, which I thought was really interesting because there are so many things that are autoimmune in nature that we don't think of as being autoimmune in nature, whether it's a mood disorder like depression or anxiety and or connected heart neuro disease. And heart disease. Type 2 diabetes. Exactly. There's, there's an immunologic connections with all of these. Certainly type one diabetes is clearly autoimmune, but right. diverticulosis may very well be autoimmune in nature. And then the question is what is triggering that autoimmunity? So thanks for sharing the story and, and, and bringing that full circle. Um, we're at almost an hour and 40 minutes. So I think we should wrap this up. Any, any closing remarks, anything we didn't talk about? Um, you know, I, on one of those white papers, I also found a bunch of literature you guys had had noted on, on seed oils or at least linoleic acid and age-related macular degeneration, that case is very strong. If people uh, are not aware of the connections between seed oil consumption and, the, you know, by proxy linoleic acid and age-related macular degeneration or ophthalmologic eye problems, that case is very strong. And there's lots of evidence for that on the Zero Acre website too. But and I'll let you guys... To be, to yeah. be clear about what that means... Age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. So you would not be saying something crazy if you said linoleic acid is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. That's how strong the evidence is. There probably will be a reel on Instagram where I say exactly that, Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're making them. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think I'll let you guys each um, have a moment to kind of summarize this and any closing remarks and we can uh, obviously bookmark it and do a part two in the future. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap it up for people here. Um, you're asking us to summarize what we've both been thinking about for the, you know, the last decade. Uh, so it'll, it'll be tough, but, uh, and anything we didn't talk about that you just want to get in there, you know, like yeah. in terms of the science stuff, like you're like, Oh, I really wanted to mention this thing. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, so I would just say, let's not forget that we talk about, some of these different diseases, some, sometimes, you know, in a bit of a silo, like let's talk about heart disease. Now let's talk about obesity. Now let's talk about insulin resistance. They're all related. And there are terms that I think Paul inadvertently said earlier, but, um, you know, like diabetes, where, where we're actually, we actually have words now to describe the relationship between these things. And so something like linoleic acid, you know, unquestionably being a, a high linoleic acid intake, unquestionably being a cause of age-related macular degeneration it probably doesn't stop there. And, and what it's doing to our eyeballs is probably also, you know, what's happening on our skin, why it's related to skin health, what's happening on the inside of our bodies, what's happening you know, and, and what causes obesity. Um, plenty of research out there, you know, showing the links between obesity and, and heart disease and, 
diabetes or insulin resistance. Um, so, you know, there, there are randomized controlled trials showing really well-designed ones showing increased rates of uh, different disease states like cardiovascular disease. Um, and while they may not measure something like insulin resistance or, you know, weight gain, um, we can probably infer that the group that had more cardiovascular disease wasn't, wasn't doing so hot when it came to insulin resistance and, you know, obesity as well. Um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll just say is, uh, we, we didn't get time to talk about it, you know, in, in too much detail, but at the bottom of the zerocure.com slash obesity post, we talk about, well, what about the studies that show seed oils are good? And we, we talked about the muffin study. Um, there, there are a handful of reasons why a lot of, why there's a lot of conflicting evidence here. Um, when you really look into it, they don't seem all that conflicting. You know, one is the over-reliance on observational studies. One is studies looking at fresh soybean oil, for example, versus cooked soybean oil. Uh, another is just the study duration. If you're looking at, you know, okay, what happens for the next few hours uh, or even for the next couple of weeks, it's just going to take longer than that to get really good data. Um, and then the, la the last point I'll make, which maybe, you know, maybe we save for another conversation is there does seem to be really interesting data on the, how genetics dictate the rate at which each of our individual bodies convert linoleic acid to downstream metabolites. And so studies, studies that show one person having low levels of linoleic acid in their body and another person having high levels, those levels don't necessarily correlate to dietary linoleic acid intake. And the person having lower levels of linoleic acid, um, but worse health outcomes, it could be because their body was so quick at converting that linoleic acid into even more harmful molecules. This is in the plasma. Very misleading. Yep, right. exactly. In the, in the, yep. Yep, the yep. plasma. Um, and you know, it, it, that's also a fascinating rabbit hole that you can kind of go down through reference on, references yeah. on the blog post. Um, but there are a lot of reasons why you should you know, look beyond the abstract or the study title when, when really looking into this stuff. Yeah, I appreciate that because that was something I wanted to touch on, that, that studies looking at levels of linoleic acid in the blood are basically worthless because we don't know uh, ALDH2 polymorphisms, you know, aldehyde dehydrogenase, these, these type of enzymatic systems that can convert linoleic acid to HNE, these can change. And like you said, Jeff, if people have lower amounts of linoleic acid in the blood, is it that they're breaking it down to HNE, you know, at, at, a, at a higher rate? And if they have higher amounts of linoleic acid in the blood, are they breaking it down to HNE less? It's, it's just not a good measure. I think that you can guys can let me know if you agree with this. I think that adipose linoleic acid is a better metric of consumption, but it's difficult to assay that. It's a metric. It's a, it's a metric of long term consumption, absolutely. But you know, just yeah, there's a lot of look. Having had this long conversation, let me put it this way: having had this long conversation between the three of us about the dangers of linoleic acid. Right to reiterate the point Jeff just made, linoleic acid itself is probably totally harmless. It's the stuff it turns into in your body. Right, every part of this obesity post is well. It turns into HNE that's toxic, or it turns into arachidonic, which acid, which turns into these endocannabinoids, which make you overeat. It's always a couple steps away from linoleic acid. So when you see a study that says, for instance, the inflammation paper saying we looked at biomarkers of linoleic acid intake, linoleic acid in the blood. We've got decades of research showing that another linoleic acid biomarker, oxidized LDL, is central to the process of cardiovascular disease, which is an inflammatory process, right? So where can people find... You guys, if they want to read more about this, we talked about zeroacre.com. The blog posts are amazing. The, the white papers are amazing. Tucker, Jeff, where can people find more information? People can find more info on me at, uh, well, I guess zeroacre.com is a good place to start because I've been kind of pouring all of my waking hours into that over the last few years. Um, but, but I also write on a number of different topics at jeffknobs.com, um, mostly focused on health and nutrition, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, uh, and uh, putting a lot of data behind the things that, you know, people tend to not put data behind. Um, and I'm on, I'm on Twitter, but haven't been tweeting too much. Um, and Tucker and I have, have written a number of those uh, blog posts together at, at zeroacre.com. Yeah, so that 
what Jeff just said. He's got some great posts on his on his uh, personal blog, by the way, getting into some other issues like the environment that aren't really covered anywhere else in the health community, but I think are very important. Um, so yeah, the zero acre posts that are coming out. Um, my blog is yelling-stop.blogspot.com. I've been doing a YouTube series of interviews lately under my name, Tucker Goodrich, and also I'm active on Twitter. Again, my handle is Tucker Goodrich. And I just want to thank Jeff for putting all this effort into this because he's really, you know, turbocharging, I think, getting this message out. And it's super important that somebody's doing this and that people are committed to getting this information out. It's been really terrific. Yeah, I appreciate you guys both massively. And I look forward to the day that I walk into a a, uh, a fast food restaurant and I say, what kind of oil do you use in your fryer? And they say, this cultured oil from this place called Zero Acre. And I go, fuck yeah, that's cool. So shout thank you out. both. What's that? Shout out shout out to Mesley, a new restaurant in San Francisco that is doing just that. They're the first restaurant oh. to start frying with cultured oil. Um, and that's Indian food. Wasn't there a McKinsey conference where they were serving culture, where they were serving zero acre cultured oil? Yeah, we were surprised, but they made a sesame dressing using cultured oil. And we're like, oh, that's cool. And just in case people were wondering, the cultured oil from zero acre is how much linoleic acid? 2%? Super low? Every batch is a little different, but um, uh, two point something, um, always less than 3%. So yeah, if you add oil and fat to your food, go, uh, go eat your low linoleic fats and oils, people. That's the, that's the key. Thank you both for this. I really appreciate you both. I think we're probably going to have to do a part two, but uh, we'll let the dust settle from this one and uh, I'll digest some of the white papers a little more. And, and I, I appreciate you both. And thanks for all your work. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Tucker.